Hello and welcome. The Setting Apart podcast is a pit stop where you can get nourished, encouraged, and refreshed whenever you need a break. I'm your host, IP, and every episode I get to share my stories, my outlook, my reflections on all things inspired through the lens of faith. So grab yourself a coffee, sit back, relax, and chill. This is part two of the introduction episode. In part one previously, we examine what it means to be holy. Just to recap, Jesus is the way, truth, and the life. To be his disciple, believing in Jesus in and by itself, is not sufficient. We need to make the commitment and sacrifices for the transformation of our heart. The universal call to all Christians is to be holy or to be set apart, to be perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect. And through baptism, all Christians have been made set apart to be in Christ, to be part of the mystical body of Christ. As such, we are called to live a life that is worthy of the gospel of Christ. And in understanding the conduct that is consistent with the gospel of Christ, we need to seek out the Lord and the word of God. For St. Jerome, ignorance of scripture is ignorance of Christ. Now, to be perfect is not about not making mistakes or that we never miss saying the rosary, but rather, it is all about the perfection of our heart and love. To love is to will the good of the other. The wisdom of St. Thomas Aquinas perfectly sums up the two greatest commandments given by Jesus. In today's episode, we are still on the theme of holiness, where we take a deep dive into prayer. In particular, how does prayer fit into the grand scheme of things? How can we be perfected in love? As we recall from the previous episode, while we may not be perfect, but by the grace of God, we can be perfected in love. To be holy is to keep the two commandments given by Jesus. Love God, love your neighbor. So the common thread to holiness is love. It's an open secret. But we must love God first before our heart can be transformed into loving our neighbor. Why is that? Well, perhaps the insights of Pope Francis from his homily for the epiphany of the Lord can help shed some light. When we do not worship God, he says, we end up worshiping ourselves. We can see that all the time how some people pray. We speak to God and we expect God to just listen, right? And God forbid, some of us even tell God how to be God. We don't do that as Catholics, right? That's not putting God first. There is no conversation. It's all coming from me, me, and me. You get the picture. And that's why the order of the commandments is so important. We got to love God first before the love of neighbor can flow out from our heart. I covered a little bit of that in part one. Feel free to check it out if you haven't already done so. Now, let's pause here and let me share a story of mine with you. There was this time our family dog Spud, um, he underwent a minor procedure that involved general anesthesia um, that had to be kept uh, at the clinic for a few hours for observation thereafter, you know, to let the anesthesia wear off. Now, the plan was the clinic was going to call when the procedure is done so we can work out um, when to pick him up. As time passed, when we did not hear from the vet, you know, my wife and I, we became anxious. We started to worry if the procedure went well, whether or not there were any complications, you know, why was it taking so long, et cetera, et cetera. And concerns uh, led to anxiety. And the longer we didn't hear from the vet, we became noticeably worried as time passed. And so in the few hours that we didn't have Spud with us at home, my wife and I started missing our dog. We felt his absence and missed his presence. Now, Spud, 
is just a dog. He's not human, and he doesn't talk, right? But he certainly knows how to communicate with us, as we learn to recognize his communication cues over time as well. He would act a certain way, for example, at different times, right? Um, during meal time, uh, he would act a certain way, and when we come home. Uh, when he needs to go, or when the water bowl needs to be refilled, etc., he'll let you know, right? He communicates with us, and in the same way, we communicate to him the house rules that we want to set, even though we don't bark or woof, right? You know, so, in spite of the fact that we cannot speak the same language as Bud, but we bonded well as a pack through communications. Now, take a moment to think about how you would communicate with God. Does your communication entail a dialogue or a monologue? You know, when was the last time God has spoken to you, as in a conversation going back and forth with each other? Do you miss God when He doesn't get to speak to you for a few hours? Think about it and be honest. What kind of relationship do you have with God now? Are you putting God first, and what kind of relationship would you like to have with Him? Feel free to pause here and reflect on the questions for a moment. Just come back and hit play when you're ready. Now, going back to Spot, he was away for a few hours, and we missed him and became concerned as time passed that we didn't hear from the vet. Yet, if I may be honest, I cannot say the same that I miss God when I have not heard from Him for a few hours. To me, that is a real wake-up call, if you will, a, a limits test that truly reveals the kind of relationship I have with God. I mean, why, why do I miss my dog by not God? My dog is just a dog, right? What does it say about my relationship with my God? Perhaps I just take for granted that He is always there when I need Him, or that He will always be there whenever I'm ready to talk, whenever I'm ready to speak to Him, or I only go to Him when I need Him. You see the pattern? It's me, me, and me. No matter how you slice it or dice it, that is not putting God first, for sure. So the limits test is a real wake-up call that shows me that my personal relationship with God is at best a shallow one, and this is one of the reasons why I'm doing this podcast. So it gives me a structure to have a more regular dialogue with God, so that I may have a deeper relationship with Him, such that if I do not hear from Him for a few hours, I would miss Him. Please pray for me, and let's pray for each other, that we could all have that loving relationship with God for real, not just a figment of our imagination, but for real. When it comes to love, we cannot mutually be in love without having a relationship with the person you're in love with. It takes two to tangle, right? Otherwise, it's just a one-way traffic. And how do we? Have a loving relationship with God. Well, that's where prayer comes in. Prayer, you see, is nothing but our relationship with God. To love God deeply, that is, to keep the first and greatest commandment. We must have a deep relationship with God first and foremost. That is, we must be deeply rooted in our prayer life, and we're going to go into that. So, taking Jesus as our model. No matter how tired or how tied up he may be, he always finds time and a quiet place to pray, to be in communion with the Father. We can all take that cue from him if we wish to walk with him. Don't take my word for it. Let's see what a couple of saints have got to say about prayer. Saint John of Damascus defines prayer as the raising up of one's mind and heart to God. Or the requesting of good things from God, and that is taken from the CCC, paragraph number twenty-five fifty-nine two five five nine. Now, raising up your mind and your heart to God is to let God know what you think and how you feel. 
so that he may guide us to the right path, just like what Jesus did when he gave a Bible study to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. Now, that would be a long dialogue covering the entire Old Testament. And so this lifting up of mind and heart to God is to let go and let God, let go of our concerns, let go of our worries, and let God be God. Pope St. John Paul II, in his apostolate letter in 2000, goes on to elaborate that prayer is, and I quote, where the meeting with Christ is expressed not just in imploring help, but also in thanksgiving, praise, adoration, contemplation, listening, and ardent devotion until the heart truly falls in love. Unquote. Now, I don't know about you, but those sounds to me like the key ingredients that we can apply to any loving relationships that we have with whom we love. So let's take that relationship between a husband and a wife, okay? Thanksgiving and praise is saying thank you and I'm grateful for what you did. And these are life-giving words that you should say to each other every day. Adoration, it's the love and respect that you have for each other. So it's like a good vintage wine. It gets better over time. Contemplation. It's what you do to work out a situation, a challenge, a disagreement, where you really need to try to understand different perspectives. And you do so by listening with your ardent devotion to each other, especially when you've been through the thick and the thin together, you need to stand by one another. And therefore, in the same way, for our heart to truly fall in love with Christ, we must have a personal relationship with Christ. As St. John, the beloved apostle, tells us, we love because he first loved us. And that's from 1 John chapter 4, verse 19. So from St. John of Damascus and St. John Paul II, we can see that prayer is about our relationship with God. And when we are in love with God deeply and wholeheartedly, this is what the Apostle Paul means when he urges the Thessalonians to pray unceasingly. You can find that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. That is, to be in love deeply, wholeheartedly, and unceasingly with Christ. So what does that look like? Well, let me elaborate that with an excellent illustration from Luigi Gioia, a Benedictine priest and scholar. In his book, Touched by God, The Way to Contemplative Prayer, Joya has this to say. Mindfulness is the foundation for contemplative prayer. He goes on to illustrate that when we say to the person we love most, I think of you all the time, it doesn't mean we have no other thoughts or that we are unable to pay attention to anything else. It means that Whenever we pause for a moment from the activities we are engaged in, for example, we could be working, studying, or exercising, etc. during the course of the day, and when we stop doing those activities, the first thing that comes to our mind is the person we love. It's like whenever we are away from our loved ones, say, when we go on a business trip or a golf trip with the boys, or shopping trip with the girls, etc., when we have a moment that we are not occupied with the things that we're doing, we would check in with our loved ones, like when we arrived at the airport or at the hotel, when we are done with our meetings, or the round of golf, or hanging out with the girls, whatever the case may be, we would check in and FaceTime our loved ones to see how they're doing, and tell them how your day went, and how you wish they were there with you. That is mindfulness. And so, in the same way, praying without ceasing does not mean that we talk to God literally 24-7 all the time, but that beneath all our activities and thoughts, there is a constant desire for and awareness of God. Just like when we are deeply in love, We desire the person we are in love with all the time, that it consumes and totally fills our mind. So, 
when we are engaged in some other activities during the course of the day, when we are at work, for example, we got to pay attention to work, right? So that we might not be aware of the underlying constant desire or awareness that we have. But as soon as we are done working, the thought of God or our awareness of Him and our trust in Him immediately comes to the surface again. And that's how it is when we are in love. The constant desire that we have to be with the person we love most. What about the constant awareness of God? Well, to illustrate, let me share some of the things I do. So from time to time, I would stop and marvel at the fascinating creation of God all around me which reminds me of his power and his real presence. For instance, the solar panel technology in the clean energy space, it's come a long way in improving its efficiency, converting solar energy to power electric energy since the 1950s. To give you some context, the efficiency has improved from about 4% from the 50s to about 15 to 20% to date. Now, that's taking into account the -the state-of-the-art, cutting-edge technology as we know it to date. Yet, when I take a look around me, the lowly primitive plants, they have been converting solar energy to chemical energy through a process called photosynthesis with a maximum efficiency estimated to be about 26% for over a billion years which was the earliest time plants were estimated to be on land. You heard that right. As advanced as our solar technology is today, it is well behind what nature has been doing for more than a billion years. Now, I won't be surprised if the solar technology created by man can surpass the plant created by God in energy conversion efficiency sooner than later. But... There are two advantages plants have that are tough to beat. First, plants can absorb CO2 or carbon dioxide at low concentration directly from air and use sunlight to turn it into fuel and oxygen. So plants can help us to reduce our carbon footprint. And second, plants also have another significant advantage, which is a bad photosynthetic cell can repair itself. In fact, that's part of its normal operation. In contrast to date, no artificial system yet devised by man, super efficient or otherwise, can heal itself. Think about that. The question is, who created the primitive lowly plants on earth? Who put the source code in them to convert light energy into chemical energy? Who wrote the algorithm for them to absorb CO2 and produce O2? for them to repair themselves when not working properly? All that since more than a billion years ago. Just open your eyes and I assure you, we can see the masterpieces of God's work all around us. There are many other ways to be aware of God's presence in our midst as well. For example, whenever we see love and compassion, kindness and goodness, humility and righteousness, God is there. And when we have a deeper relationship with God, we become more aware of His presence. Just like a sheep would recognize the good shepherd's voice. And that did not happen overnight, but through a period of bonding, of trust, and relationship with the good shepherd. Now, if we understand that prayer is all about our relationship with God, and that mindfulness is the foundation of contemplative prayer, then we can make the connection of what St. Paul says about praying unceasingly in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, is that Paul is telling the Thessalonians to be deeply in love with God. And this brings us back full circle to Matthew 22, which is the first commandment. You shall love the Lord your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. We got to love God with everything you got. Now, if we want to have a vibrant relationship with Christ, just knowing the two great commandments in and by itself, it's not going to cut it, right? Those who said, Lord, Lord, they know the commandments, in fact, better than anyone else. 
But guess what? Jesus said to them, I never knew you. So clearly, just knowing is not enough. We need to live it. As Pope St. John Paul II points out, and I quote, Christian life today has to be lived deeply, or else it may not be possible to live it at all. The lives of the saints demonstrate that this vibrant union or relationship with Christ is achieved in prayer. It shows how prayer can progress as a genuine dialogue of love to the point of rendering the person wholly possessed by the Divine Beloved, vibrating at the Spirit's touch, resting filially within the Father's heart. This is the lived experience of Christ's promise. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. It is a journey totally sustained by grace, which nonetheless demands an intense spiritual commitment and is no stranger to painful purifications. Unquote. So looking at the lives of saints, we can see that prayer can help us move from starting with just a dialogue, a dialogue with Christ, to the point where our heart is completely filled with the grace of the Divine Beloved. How beautiful is that? So prayer is important. It is about our relationship, not just with anyone else, but our relationship with God. And only when we are deeply and wholeheartedly in love with God can we then be in love with our neighbor. But we cannot do it on our own. We need the grace of God. We need the spiritual commitment on our part to follow Jesus. And we need the trust in the process, the process of transformation, which could be painful at times, but we would know. If we feel the pain, then we might be heading in the right direction. When we are fully transformed, we can even find joy amidst our pain, just like the saints have before us. And looking at the lives of saints can be very inspiring indeed. I will leave you a famous quote from Oscar Wilde that I picked up in a Bible sharing session. It reads, The only difference between the saint and the sinner is that every saint has a past and every sinner has a future. Unquote. Now, the saints have gone through what you and I are going through right now, the trials, the tribulations, and they are no different than you and I. We are both, in fact, we are all blood and flesh. So if they can do it, I believe so can we. So let's dig in and let's do this together. To summarize, communication is the foundation of any relationship. Prayer is how we communicate with God in a conversation. To be in communion with Him. When we consistently have a conversation with anyone, we have a relationship. And so prayer is about our relationship with God. And in order to love God deeply, that is to keep the first commandment, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind, we must be deeply rooted in prayer. In the first episode, we've seen that prayer is a two-way dialogue to communicate with God, where we speak to God when we pray, and God speaks to us when we read the divine oracles. That would be an excellent starting point if we want to start building a relationship with God, starting as a genuine dialogue of love until our heart truly falls in love with Christ. Amen? Amen. Now, To conclude part two of the introduction, here are the key takeaways. To be perfected in love, we got to have a solid relationship with Christ. Now, we already know how much He loves us by laying down His life for us. The question then becomes, how much do we love Him? We can get the ball rolling by doing something tangible, like starting a conversation by lifting our thoughts and our heart to Christ. Then we open our heart to hear the living Word of God by reading Holy Scripture. And we embrace ourselves in His presence through contemplative prayer. Now, Lectio Divina and Ignatius Contemplation are a couple of ways that I know of to get into it. Feel free to check them out at your own choosing. 
looking ahead in part three of the introduction, I will take a closer look at baptism as it relates to our call to holiness. In particular, how is it that we are called to be holy in baptism? And why is baptism so powerful that it can wipe away the stains of original and actual sins? Stay tuned for that in episode 3. As Christians, you definitely do not want to miss that. So there you have it for episode 2. All the references I made in the podcast can be found in the show notes on the website. Now the URL for the website is settingapart.com. Setting apart is one word, settingapart.com. I invite you to get to know Jesus better and start a meaningful relationship with him today. Pick up the Bible and listen to what he's got to say. Thank you for listening to the Setting Apart podcast. If you like what you hear, please subscribe and get notified so you won't miss any new episodes. And please feel free to give me your ratings and reviews so that others may get to listen as well. Thank you and God bless.